Hi everyone, in this video I'm going to show you some of my favourite artistic tips and tricks that I use in Blender, but before we do that I need to tell you that this video is sponsored by NVIDIA and PC Specialist. Basically NVIDIA Studio is an initiative by NVIDIA to work with PC builders like PC Specialist to design products for creative professionals. So these products are designed to maximise the use of the NVIDIA GPUs to speed up your workflows in different creative applications like Blender and Premiere, DaVinci Resolve and pretty much anything that utilises the GPU for hardware acceleration. So I'll leave a link below if you want to check out what they have to offer. So yeah, over the last few years of doing tutorials, there are a few specific tips and tricks that I love to use with Blender. I've collected a few of them for this video. There's more that I want to share, but I might do them in other videos. I also think this video would act as a good reference. So if I needed to share these tips with anyone else in the future, I can give them a specific timestamp. So let's get into it. The first tip I want to talk to you about is actually a few tips combined into one. It's extracting the hue and saturation values from a generated noise texture, as well as using the musk grave to get seemingly infinite surface imperfection details. So taking a look at my screen here, you can see I've got a few nodes set up, texture coordinate, plugging into the noise texture, into a color ramp, and then I can plug this straight into the principal BSDF shader. This is what the basic noise texture looks like. It's pretty normal, quite boring, and we can restrict the values using a color ramp. That's nothing out of the ordinary, people use that all the time. But did you know that if you pass the color into a separate HSV node, so hue saturation value, and then bring the H down into the color ramp, suddenly we get a very, very different pattern. Now the two things to pop to mind here are coffee stain and camouflage. So this would be a good fundamental base for doing any of those kinds of patterns. We have a mix of where we have this blending from high to low values, and then also sharp edges where the values seem to clamp off. You can of course change the color ramp mode to something like constant, then move the white further down, so we can just get harsh values from this and then suddenly we get a cow pattern. So it's very versatile and you can play around with all the different values and see what you can get with it. Alternatively, using the same node combination, we can plug the saturation value into the ramp. And then if I expand these a bit, we can see we get something that's quite different to the H value. It's very nebulous. If I increase the roughness, we can see that we can make this even more random. So this is a very, very cool surface imperfection effect. And even still increasing the distortion, we can add some extra variety to this. So just with a couple of node combinations, you can get some very, very powerful generated effects on the surface. Very similar to using the Musgrave. Now the Musgrave is interesting because if I get a version of the node where I have not modified the values, plug in the object input, plug the height into the color ramp, and go. Musgrave itself is just completely boring. There's nothing special about this. It's very simple. Sure, maybe we can turn up the scale to get a nice looking effect, but even still, it's a bit basic. But Musgrave has this hidden potential, where if you turn the default value for dimension all the way down, you might think, well, nothing really much has happened here. Nothing has changed. But then, yeah, if we turn the lacunarity up, suddenly we get some interesting patterns occurring. So I think, okay, well, something different is happening here, but then what happens if we amplify the detail afterwards? And then, aha, all of a sudden, we have an extremely powerful surface imperfection effect, where we are getting essentially seemingly infinite detail from one single node. So I've modified the values how I like them with the first Musgrave texture here. So if I plug that in, this is how I would usually use it with these values, 16, 10, 0, and 3. And then we can restrict the range with a color ramp afterwards. Now, the reason why I have one of these test renders from my modular metals pack is because a lot of the generated textures used in the process of making this was from the Musgrave node, as well as the noise separated H and S values. These are basically my go-to values if you need something that's random, but not easily identifiable as a pre-existing pattern. Now we move on to ambient occlusion, which is by far and away my favorite procedural effect ever because it's so powerful. So here you can see I have got a basic shape here on the right. It's just got a bit of curvature pointing into a middle point where everything comes together. And then on the left, we have the material nodes and you can see the ambient occlusion node up here plugged into a color ramp with the black moved along into the base color for a principal BSDF. And then as we render the screen here, you can see that the crevices of the object are darkened and we can change the effect of this by moving the ramp back and forth. And we can also apply color to it as well if we want it to get like some darkened blue. Now that by itself is fine, but there's a lot more you can do with ambient occlusion. But for the sake of having a cool a mesh demonstration, I'm going to bring up another model of mine. So here we go. If you watched the Biogen V9 announcement video recently, you might recognize this model. But this is a really, really cool demonstration for the ambient occlusion because if I unplug it here, you can see that we just have this tangle effect going on around the body. It looks pretty cool, but it could do with being a bit more interesting. But by adding the AO, it gives us a bit of shadowing in between the objects, all of a sudden we get this very cool darkened effect. And if you're into stylistic rendering, we can do a lot with this because say I can make, you know, that darkened area red, for example, and play with the values. So where things are intersecting or they're coming close together, we're getting this red effect. And then I can quickly change the higher areas to maybe something a bit more bluish. So you can see we can get these interesting procedural color combinations without having to do any manual texturing around the object. So that's why I love ambient occlusion. It's so powerful. But like I said, there's more we can do with this. So let me bring my old object back. So in this other material, I've got two things going on here. 
At the top here, I have a procedural noise texture being separated into HSV again. Remember the previous tip? The H is being plugged into a color amp. And if I plug that into the principled BSDF, you can see we're getting just a general grungy pattern going around the object. Now below here, we have ambient occlusion with the color amp. And if I plug that straight into the principled BSDF, you can see we're getting the opposite of what we were doing beforehand, where instead of darkening the inner areas, we're darkening the outer areas. And that's because I want to use AO as a mask. So I want the white values, imagine them representing a one, whereas a zero would represent black, to tell our texture where we want it to distribute our grunge. So I have a mix shader node here. I'm using the AO as the factor input, so it's our mask. Color one will be the base color of the object, and then color two, we will plug in our new grunge texture, and then I'll plug that into the base color, and then all of a sudden you can see that we have a grunge effect happening on the inner areas of the mesh. And this is all procedural. So again, the ambient occlusion being white to this time as controlled by the color ramp, where white defines the inner areas is being passed as the factor input, so the mask. So that's dictating where the grunge should go. So if I go and modify this object now, if I go into say edge mode, maybe add a couple of extra edge loops, scale that in a bit more. And then maybe if I grab like one area like this and kind of rotate, fold it in so we get some more crevices going, you can see that where areas come close together or where they're in close proximity, this grunge effect is being procedurally added to them. So that's the power of ambient occlusion. Not only does it act as a really cool stylistic tool, but it also acts as a really cool masking tool. And then the image I have down here as a demonstration is one of the product images from my ambient grunge node. So you can see here how that effect is used to grab where the areas of objects come together so we can apply a grungy material to it. So exploiting volumes. Volumes are one of my favorite atmospheric effects in Blender because you can get so much variety with them and they're so grounded in reality. Like we're never going to get bored of a volume and we're so used to it in real life as well like when there's mist and fog and the clouds and all of that. So I don't think volumes will ever go out of style. But for my work, one of the reasons I love using volumes is so I can get color gradients going across 3D space, especially for a background for a character, for example. So if I pick one of these colors here and move it around, the color of the gradient behind it is also changing. So let me just change the color and you can see how we can get a different effect. One of the really cool things is that if you're using the EV rendering engine, and then if you look under the color properties, you'll see that you have independent control for the influence of the light on the volume. So if I scrub the value down for this light, you can see that it's no longer affecting the volume, but it's still affecting the object. This means that yes, you can have different lighting affecting the object as you have affecting the volume. So it means you can get remarkable control over the change of color in the scene. So I've demonstrated that a few times in other videos, but I love it, I think it's fantastic. But one thing I will say is that that independent control does not exist for the cycles version. So if you go into the light properties, you'll see that that value is not there. Okay, so another thing I like doing for my artwork is using emissive particles to give a sense of depth in a scene. It's a very cheap trick because it's fairly easy to set up. And as your camera moves through the scene, as I demonstrated in my Epoch animated short, the particles further away from the camera move at a slower pace. So that's a parallax effect essentially. So it gives a quick sense that you are actually moving through a scene. So if nothing else much is changing in the scene, it gives a good sense of depth. Because if your brain can identify those particles moving, then you can go, oh wow, this scene must be a lot bigger than it looks to start with. Setting the particle systems requires a few more steps than you would expect though. And as soon as we get the distribute points in a volume node for geometry nodes, it'll be extraordinarily simple, but I might as well tell you how to do it with particle systems for now. So I have my object to be instanced here. It's just a sphere with a simple emissive material on it. And then I have a separate object, which is actually a cube which will act as the particle system. On this cube, under the particle properties tab, you can see that I have made a particle system. It has been set to emitter. The frame start and end values have been set to zero and the lifetime 1000. That's because I just wanted it to exist for far longer than I would have any animation. Under velocity, I turned the normal down to zero. I'm not sure if you need to do this, but I just did it as a force of habit. Then under physics, physics type set to none because we don't want anything to move. Under render, I have it set to render as object. So it's going to actually render objects inside of the particle system. You can change it to collection if you want. I've never actually tried that. I imagine it would just take a random one from the collection you provide. And it's also control for changing the scale value here as well. So you can make all of the instance points much larger if you need to. And then I've disabled show emitter because we want to actually hide this in our 3D scene so it doesn't get in the way while we're making artwork. Under object, instance object, I have it set to emissive particle, which is our original object. Side note, if you hover over a field like this and press E, you will get an eyedropper tool. So then you can go and find the object in your outliner or in the 3D scene and then click on it and then it will choose that for the field. So you don't have to go searching for it in the dropdown. Okay, so that should distribute it inside the cube, but there's a couple of other things you need to do to hide the cube from the scene. So the first one I already mentioned under render, you disable show emitter, but then under the object properties, you need to go to instancing and then disable viewport and render for the show instances. So if you disable those tick boxes, it should be hidden. So now you don't see the box, you only see the particles, which is exactly what we want. And then when you render, you will also just see the particles. And then if you combine that with like EV effects and get some nice bloom going, say I turn up the intensity, or if I turn up the 
you know, the emission value and then turn down the scale a bit. Then you can get some really pretty effects going, you know, like a star field or dust particles or whatever you like. So another technique I want to show you is using transparent image planes. Now there's a wide range of reasons why you would use these. They can be used as atmospheric effects and just for decoration. And it's a technique that goes back, well, generations in the digital space. Because as you probably know, image planes are used a lot for vegetation, for doing cheap renders of like plants and flowers and stuff like that. But the way I've used them, if you take a look at these images, is if you see down here in this artwork where I have this atmospheric scene, this was done in cycles and originally it was quite difficult using volumes to do all the effects because it was so slow and noisy. But if you watch my last video, you know that there's been a lot of improvements in that regard relating to Cycles X and viewport performance. But for this gust of dust or sand effect, if you want to think of it like that, coming up across the character here, we could have done something like that with procedural volume nodes, but it just wasn't viable. So instead in a separate application, I did a paint stroke of white pixels on a transparent background. Same thing for the splash effect going on as well that was a separate texture I then brought those into blender and then used them as a plane similarly for these other pieces of artwork I used image planes for doing this effect behind the characters so these were brought in with transparency and they were given an emission value to make them appear through the volume now it's very easy to set these up in cycles because if you bring in your texture in an image texture node and if you're using the principal BSDF shader it's great because it already supports alpha transparency so if you plug the color into the base color the alpha into the alpha obviously and then when you punch that through the surface value then it should appear fine in your free view Note that if you want to do this with Eevee, then if you go over to Eevee under the material settings, if you scroll down to the settings section, you will probably need to set the blend mode to something like alpha blend. There are different modes available depending on what you want to use it for, but alpha blend is the one that you would usually use. So like I said, there's lots of reasons you might use this. You know, you could use it for the atmospherics, decoration, light rays, graffiti, iconography, faking 3D objects using something called a billboard system, which is where you have a 2D plane that always points towards the camera. So that would be useful for like distant vegetation and stuff. 2D image planes in 3D space are just extremely powerful. So it's just something to keep in mind. Anyway, that's all the tips I want to show you for this video. I have others that I can show you as well if you want to do this again. Let me know if you have any amazing tips that you want to share with people as well. Just leave them in the comments below. Like I said, this video is sponsored by NVIDIA and PC Specialist. They're working together with the NVIDIA Studio Initiative to design products for creative professionals. And if you check the link in the description, you'll be taken to the PC Specialist website where you'll see a list of recommended specs by NVIDIA for a whole range of budgets. And then you can choose one as a starting point and customize it to your liking. I really like the PC Specialist website. I think it's really fun to play with and I spent hours on there when I was designing my current computer. But if you're looking for some serious horsepower for your rendering capabilities, then it's definitely worth checking out. And also keep in mind that NVIDIA GPU products have excellent integration with Blender, produce of CUDA, and optics for GPU acceleration for your renders. Check out my last sponsored video about Cycles X viewport performance if you want to learn more about that. So yeah, thanks for watching everyone. Hope you have a fantastic day and I will see you next time.